Okay, so at this moment, I want to introduce uh, uh, Ed Goldman. Uh, uh, Ed, Ed has been uh, on the legal uh, in the legal profession for a few years here. He ran the legal department here at the university for a good number of years and uh, is now it's with, your, with OBGYN uh, right now and is working uh, with, uh, with them and has been focused over the past several years on ethic, ethical issues relating to uh, stem cells. And I'm going to find your talk right here. Oops. So, Ed Goldman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. So they've asked a, a lawyer to talk about ethics, which is kind of interesting to start out with. Um, the um, last picture that Dr. O'Shea showed you, I just want to assure you that she is allowed to come into the lobby of that big building. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about um, ethics. I am uh, an attorney. Uh, when I first started running the health system legal office here, there were still dinosaurs on campus. They've gone away now. Uh, and I have moved to the obstetrics and gynecology department where I am working on medical legal issues and issues involving uh, women's health and women's rights uh, issues. So I'm going to talk about uh, ethical and legal issues in research you all instantly know uh, that those are not the same thing. There are things that can be uh, legal that some people could see as uh, unethical. There are things that some people could see as ethical that are currently illegal, and I'm going to give you an example of that. The first thing you need to do following Dr. O'Shea's talk is uh, get all those neurons in your brain to move out of the scientific side of your brain into the ethics side of your brain so that you can follow this uh, discussion. That's you probably had a slide showing how to do that. Uh, so, yeah, you're working at it right. Um, so, you know that uh, research is governed both by good scientific method, uh, by federal regulations, um, and Professor T Schneider will be talking to you more about that uh, in a minute, um, and by ethical issues. Uh, in Michigan, Prior to the election in 2008, it was illegal to destroy an embryo for research purposes. It was not illegal to just destroy an embryo. People who created embryos for reproductive purposes could say, uh, you know what, I don't want these embryos anymore. I don't want to store them in your freezer anymore. Uh, what are my options? And we could say to them, well, we could implant them in you uh, we could implant them in somebody else. They could, in effect, adopt your embryos, uh, or we could throw them down the drain. What we couldn't say was we could use them for the kind of research uh, that you just saw. Why was that? Because there was a law in Michigan that said to destroy an embryo for research was illegal. Now, what happened? Well, a group of us uh, at the university uh, petitioned the legislature, asked whether they would change the law. They said, no, thank you. Uh, after a couple of years of uh, doing that, we looked at the possibility of passing a constitutional amendment uh, that would override uh, that law. We went to a public relations group. Uh, we talked to them about the current status, and they said to us, wait a minute. You can throw them down the sink, but you can't use them to cure cancer? And we said, yes, that's correct. Uh, and they said, well, that's your hook. Just whatever sentence you utter from now on, always attach two words to the end of the sentence, which are cure cancer. Right? And go forth and do good. So a group of us, Sue, myself, uh, Sean Morrison, a bunch of other uh, people, went to uh, every church, every synagogue, every Kiwanis club, every Elks club. Sue and I, if you would like, later on can sing you the songs from uh, Kiwanis Lunch. Um, and uh, we can. <laughs> and we gave this talk. And the talk was, so let me see. You can throw these things down the drain, or you can use them to cure cancer. What do you think? Um, and in 2008, the voters approved Proposition 2. This was four years ago when voters were actually approving 
propositions, um, and they approved Proposition 2, and it removed uh, the Michigan restriction that it was illegal to damage or destroy an embryo for research. What did that mean? It meant that instead of Sue going to her friends uh, at Harvard and at Wisconsin, she could generate her own embryonic stem cell lines. That has profound legal uh, implications. If we generate our own, we own them. We own the patent rights. If we discover something, it's ours. If we borrow cells from our friends and they give them to us with some strings attached, which is have fun with these, if you invent something, we own it, there is a practical uh, problem. So prior to the vote, we could do research on other people's cell lines but couldn't create our own. And that means if we wanted to create bipolar stem cell lines, we would have had to find somebody somewhere else who was interested in doing that, but nobody was. Harvard was interested in diabetes cells. Other people were interested in other cells. We were interested in creating uh, cells that would further the kind of research we're talking about today. Why regulate research? Uh, Carol will talk to you more about this, but essentially, the idea behind the regulations governing human subjects research is to protect subjects, not to advance science. It's all about uh, protection. Uh, why? Because of past problems. If you have things like Nazi Germany, if you have things like the Tuskegee uh, syphilis study, which was actually the United States Public Health Service uh, syphilis study, uh, you have people saying there ought to be a law, right? First you have bad practices and you have a reaction, then you have there ought to be a law, and the laws that we passed were laws to protect uh, society while allowing society to proceed. So why destroy embryos? You heard from Dr. O'Shea that embryos can become every tissue uh, in the human body, and if we can understand how that happens, it could be a major breakthrough uh, in terms of creating tissue, repairing tissue. It is also important for studying uh, drugs uh, in culture. Uh, and some of these embryos would never be used for reproductive purposes anyway because you can determine that they are unsuitable for implantation into a human being. Uh, we do what is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and we can determine uh, that an embryo has a lethal anomaly uh, and should not be uh, used. What could we do with those? Throw them out, but we couldn't use them to cure cancer or for research uh, purposes. Uh, you've heard about adult cells, iPS cells. They have their purposes. They are not nearly uh, as useful uh, in terms of understanding uh, differentiation. So then the question becomes, but isn't using an embryo in this way murder? You saw that you have to remove the inner uh, cell mass of a five to eight day embryo, and that means the embryo can no longer be used for reproduction. Last week, uh, in a uh, class that I teach, I invited uh, the legislative uh, director for Right to Life, uh, who was opposed to the 2008 uh, proposal and said to him, um, why have you never tried to just criminalize destruction of embryos? And he said, well, we thought that would be a loser. And I said, well, wh what's your position about embryos? And he said, our ethical position is that once you fertilize an egg, it is human life. And I said, well, isn't it murder if you throw an embryo down the drain? And he said, we believe it is, uh, but we can't convince the legislature or uh, the Michigan voters. So we have given up uh, on that, uh, but we continued uh, in 2008 to fight about uh, use of embryos for research purposes, and even though we lost that battle, we will still continue to fight, and we are currently talking to the Michigan legislature about having them cut the University of Michigan's budget because the University of Michigan is doing research uh, with embryos. So this is not a fight that you resolve at the polls and then everybody uh, moves forward. It is a fight uh, that is still uh, going on. Uh, Sue showed you a version of that slide, a nicer version with little green uh, outside for what becomes placenta. Uh, and uh, what you know is that was a five-day embryo. 
the thing she didn't tell you is that that picture was magnified uh, very much, and the true size of that uh, is much smaller than the period at the end of that sentence. There's no spinal cord, there's no brain, there's no limbs, there's no heart. It is simply a mass of undifferentiated uh, cells. And you say, yeah, so what? Isn't it potential uh, life? And that's the issue uh, that causes the ethical uh, discussion. If it has the potential for life, shouldn't we treat it uh, with at least respect, uh, if not forbearance? So what do we have to do in ethics? We have to figure out a balance. The same thing we do as lawyers, the scales uh, of justice. Uncontrolled research which doesn't respect human rights is the fear that people have. Uh, the potential benefit is the one uh, that you just saw, allowing science to pursue new avenues that can result in new knowledge and new cures. Um, I've never gotten over the public relations people. I always end sentences with cures. Um, so what do you do? We can use these stem cells from embryos with a known disease to study the development of that disease and possible treatments in a dish, not in uh, human beings. Why, why are we even having this discussion? Because there's fear, because there's fear of science. Uh, some of you remember uh, when we first started looking at recombinant DNA and there was this concern that evil things would leak out under the doors of the labs uh, and change the uh, course of the world. Uh, and we had ethics committees uh, to think about that. Um, and I should actually pause to say that because of things like that, people like me got involved in uh, genetics and because of people like Dr. O'Shea, people like me actually started to understand a small amount of genetics, enough to be dangerous perhaps, but at least a small amount of uh, genetics. So I need to thank uh, my medical colleagues who actually try their best to make me smart uh, in this area. Um, so then you say, well, what about, what, maybe we need, maybe this isn't the Wild West, maybe we need some guidelines. What about medical uh, guidelines? Can we have some way to think about how we can conduct this research uh, safely? So the Institute of Medicine, in 2005 wrote a report called Guidelines for Human Embryonic uh, Stem Cell uh, Research. Uh, this was actually the uh, architecture for that big building that uh, uh, Dr. O'Shea saw you, uh, showed you. Um, so the book is called uh, Guidelines for Human Embryonic Stem Cell Research, uh, and what the guidelines call for is heightened oversight of research. Now heightened means that in addition to what you will hear about in terms of institutional review boards, boards at the university who look at research, there is also some other oversight that can occur, and I'll talk to you about what that is in a second. Uh, there needs to be a standard way to obtain, store, distribute, and use stem cell lines from embryos. You can't just do it however you wanna uh, do it. There needs to be public uh, education, which is part of the reason uh, that Dr. O'Shea and I and uh, Dr. Morrison and others went all over the state. We did town hall meetings, we did uh, public uh, meetings, we did meetings uh, wherever, I, you know, street corners, where any bars late at night, well, any place there were two or more people, we would go and talk to them about embryonic stem cells uh, to help them understand the science uh, and the rationale. And you have to understand the science. It's not just understanding uh, the ethics, you have to understand. Uh, the science. So the guidelines, now, when the National, when the Institute of Medicine suggests guidelines, it becomes like law. Everybody does it. And everybody does it this way because it seems like uh, the right way. And, and so what the guidelines call for is let's only use embryos, blastocysts, that are about to be destroyed anyway. Let's only use embryos that were created for reproductive purposes, the people who created them don't want them anymore, don't want to keep them in the freezer, don't want to donate them to someone else, say, I'm ready to have these destroyed. Let's make sure there's no payment. Oh, you're gonna destroy them? How about, we'll give you 50 bucks and we could use them for research. That's not ethical. Um, no reproductive cloning. Um, we have to use a blastocyst before uh, day 14, and the idea there was, is there a point where we can say these cells are moving from undifferentiated to somewhat 
differentiated. The primitive streak, the streak, I have to watch Sue because she frowns at me when I get the medicine really badly wrong, but I'm, I'm doing okay, so yeah, right. Um, so by, by day 14, uh, these cells are starting to differentiate. Well, frankly, from our standpoint, the earlier we get the cells, the better for research anyway. We don't want differentiated cells. We would like the undifferentiated cells if we can. So nobody put up a big fight about uh, 14 days uh, because, uh, as you saw, we were getting embryos at day five to eight, uh, roughly. So that seemed fine, and it seemed something that was easy to say to the public. When, once, once it's starting to develop the beginning of uh, the nervous system, we're not going to be doing uh, this research. Uh, I told you I would tell you in a second about heightened oversight. The heightened oversight is called the Embryonic Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee. Uh, unfortunately, Institute of Medicine isn't good at looking at the first letters of uh, words before they uh, name something. This is the escrow uh, committee. Those of you who do real estate law know why that's a very bad idea to call. Uh, so this is the escrow committee, the Embryonic Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee, um, and the idea is this committee uh, looks at every research uh, proposal at the University of Michigan uh, proposing to use embryonic stem cells or induce, induced pluripotent cells to make sure that they are in accord with uh, these guidelines and good uh, practice. We have to have full informed choice for donors, and that means if I am uh, your reproductive medicine doctor and you say to me, I don't want this embryo anymore, I can't say to you, oh, well, let me tell you what comes next. What I have to say to you is, let me have you talk to Dr. Smith uh, or Dr. O'Shea or somebody else, independent. I'm your doctor for this. Uh, they're researchers. You need to talk to them uh, and uh, they will inform you about what your choices uh, can be. Uh, we can't create, as you've heard, uh, mixed living human animal models. This is a scientific uh, problem, as, as you saw. This is also a problem uh, if, like me, you have grandchildren who say, but I like those animals in the Harry Potter book. Why can't you make those? Uh, and you have to say, well, later, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. But right now, uh, we can't do anything that would freak the American public out. And Star Wars uh, and uh, mixed human animal models uh, might. The ethical theory here is to allow science to proceed, but with detailed legal, ethical, and social, all three. Has to be good public policy, has to be good ethics, has to be good law oversight. So we have a committee to do this. Uh, what's the ethical approach? I think, and the reason the seminar is constructed the way it is today, you have to understand the facts, you have to understand the science, you have to understand the potential for new treatments, you have to be respectful, for potentials of uh, blastocysts. You have to avoid fear mongering. Uh, those of you who remember the 2008 campaign, remember that the opponents uh, to Proposition 2 uh, told people that this was another Tuskegee experiment, that this would raise your taxes. Somehow changing the law would raise everybody's uh, taxes, that blastocysts had feelings. Um, I got, I, normally I restrain myself. Uh, but there was one debate where uh, the person I was debating was arguing about feelings that blastocysts had, and I said, do me a favor, could you collect really tiny Afghans? And he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, we got all these blastocysts in the freezer, they're probably cold. He didn't think that was funny. You didn't think it was funny either. Okay. Um, respectful debate leads to shared decision making. That's really uh, what we have to do. We can't talk past each other. And one of the problems that I had over and over again was I think ethical debate works when there's an honest exchange of reviews with respect for both sides. If you take a rules-based approach, which is what I faced over and over again, murder is wrong, embryos are human beings, murder is wrong, we're done. And I go through what Sue uh, and others taught me to do so carefully. Look, we're gonna throw them out anyway. Why can't we use them? Why can't we do science? with them. What good does it do to just throw them out? It doesn't respect them. It doesn't do any good. We're just talking past each other. Because what I am using in philosophical terms is a consequentialist argument, and what the other side is using is a rules-based argument. Murder is wrong, 
and I'm saying, what's the greatest good for the greatest number? And we're just going right past each other. So we have to figure out a way to talk uh, to each other and have some meaningful uh, dialogue. So what's happening in Michigan now? November 2008, the voters approved a constitutional amendment. We can now use about to be destroyed embryos created for reproductive purposes or not suitable uh, for research. And the result is uh, what you saw, saw in Dr. O'Shea's uh, beautiful uh, slides. We have uh, a number of projects dependent on federal funding. Being dependent on federal funding uh, raises some issues uh, that we don't have time to go into today, but I don't want to uh, ignore them. There are always patent issues. There are always strings attached with uh, funding. Um, you saw Dr. O'Shea's work. Uh, Dr. Gary Smith is also looking at disease-specific lines. These are not lines we could get from anybody else. These are lines that we would have had that we have to create uh, here to look at hemophilia, to look at some neurological uh, diseases. Uh, you've heard about the Prechter Fund work uh, to study bipolar uh, disorder. We have significant federal funding for this uh, research, and that raises uh, the last issue that I want to go into, uh, which is the whole question of federal funding. Federal funding is controlled by uh, NIH and the federal government and a law called the Dickey Wickert Amendment. This was passed in 1995 by two uh, congressmen, and it does not allow federal funding for any research that would damage or destroy an embryo. Same law that we had in Michigan, still law uh, at the federal level, no federal funding. 2010, a federal judge, Judge Lambert, uh, issued uh, an order, a uh, preliminary injunction is just an order to stop federal funding for any embryonic stem cell research. The idea was, wait, if you can't use federal funds to derive these stem cell lines, then why should you be able to use federal funding to study the lines? Sort of like killing your parents and saying to the judge, Your Honor, I'm an orphan. You know, if you can't do the initial act, how can you do uh, the second uh, act? So Dickie Wickard says, none of the funds are made, made available uh, for NIH grants can be used for the creation of an embryo for research purposes or destruction uh, of an embryo. Well, April of 2011, the Federal Court of Appeals, remember it's District Court, Court of Appeals in the United States Supreme Court, reversed the trial court and said, no, government can fund research, they just can't fund the initial creation of the stem cell uh, line. Case came back to trial court, uh, July, Judge Lambert dismissed the case, um, and surely the plaintiff uh, in the case appealed. Shirley's an interesting guy. He actually doesn't do stem cell research at all. His claim was, uh, if the federal government is giving money for stem cell research, then there is less money for my research. And if I can get them to stop giving that money, then there'll be more money uh, for other uh, research. Uh, this is an argument that you sometimes come up uh, with in ethics. Well, if you're giving money for that, then you're not giving money for this. And, and it's, it, there's always an argument that you can make there. Uh, August of this year, just a couple months ago, the Federal Appeals Court in D.C. Uh, upheld Judge Lambert saying um, district court didn't commit any error and therefore surely you lose. Um, but October 11, uh, surely appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court doesn't have to take the case. Um, probably they will not, but there is a chance uh, that they could. So this litigation is not yet finished at the moment. The federal government is funding research uh, in embryonic stem cells, uh, and it is quite a sizable amount. It's like more than $400 million, uh, and uh, that would put a serious dent in people's budget uh, if this case were uh, overruled. Uh, now, how can you change that? Well, former Senator Arlen Specter uh, in 2010 introduced the Stem Cell Research Advancement uh, Act with Representative DeJet, who uh, said, uh, look, we're just going to overrule uh, Dickie Wickert. We're going to allow federal funding for all sorts of research, including creating uh, these cell lines. Now, the other funding issue is a state funding issue. You know that California has devoted a large amount of money to stem cell research. New York has devoted a large amount of money. Wisconsin has devoted a large amount of money. Michigan does not have any state funding program, uh, and there are continuing legislative efforts uh, to adversely impact embryonic stem cell research in Michigan. As I said, the Michigan legislature is thinking about cutting the amount of money that goes to 
the University of Michigan because we do uh, this uh, type of research. Uh, and you know, what that really means is somebody's going to do the research. The question is who? Is it going to be done here? Is it going to be done uh, somewhere else? Uh, now, that means uh, now that we've decided the results of the November 2012 election, we can start thinking once we figure out, you know, the deficit, the financial cliff, the wars, trivial stuff, we can start thinking about important stuff like embryonic stem cell uh, research funding uh, and think about whether that is going to be supported uh, at the federal level uh, or uh, the state uh, level. Uh, that should leave you with uh, some uh, questions, and the ethical questions are things like, well, what's going to happen uh, next? Are we going to start seeing an explosion of research? Are we going to start seeing research going in directions uh, that we might not like? Are we on what lawyers call a slippery slope to cloning, uh, to chimeras, uh, to creation of embryos solely for research, uh, using embryos to create uh, tissue that will be reproducible? Uh, are we creating artificial uh, babies? Um, and as Dr. O'Shea said, uh, all you have to do is uh, go to any checkout line uh, at any supermarket with the possible exception of Whole Foods, who always has those healthy magazines in the checkout uh, lines, uh, and uh, pick one up. And you'll see things like Stanford scientists turn stem cells into precursors for sperm and eggs so that they can make designer uh, babies. Um, so that's an approach. The other approach is this might be the most exciting science uh, that we can have if we can create artificial organs in the lab, if we can create patches uh, for damage because of heart attacks, if we can learn more about uh, these diseases uh, and how to uh, deal with them not in utero, not in human uh, subjects, not in animal uh, subjects, but in uh, little dishes uh, in the lab, uh, we can uh, really move forward. And that means that we have to know uh, whether research will be encouraged to flourish in Michigan, uh, whether it will be worthwhile. Now, one of the arguments that we all heard was, well, look, you've had these embryos for a couple of years now. Have you cured anything lately? Uh, and the response was, you know, we had adult stem cells for 30 years before we figured out how to cure leukemia. Uh, and science moves slowly. It moves deliberately. It's not I've had these embryos for a week, uh, and I haven't cured anything, so it must not be uh, any good. So you have, you have to always ask what the change in public policy did. November 2008, we made a change in Michigan. Did that lead to inhumane treatment of embryos? The prior law didn't stop embryos from being thrown out. Now people have a choice. They can say, I want to keep the embryos. I want to donate them to somebody else. I want them thrown out, or I want them used for research. That's all the change did. It gave people another option. So instead of saying, I want them thrown out because I don't want to pay to keep them in the freezer anymore, they can now say, I want to donate them. And that's what they've been doing. Uh, it's been uh, very nice uh, to see the responsiveness of the Michigan public and the American public. We, in fact, have had some people say, we would like to create an embryo so that we can donate it. And we say, no, we can't do that. You have to have created them uh, for reproductive purposes. Uh, you cannot create them for research purposes. And they say, why not? We say, we are not there yet. That's not what the guidelines of the Institute of Medicine say. We may never be there. Uh, it is uh, a procedure that we follow. Uh, and uh, we are only taking embryos that were about to be destroyed uh, anyway. So where does this, where does this leave us? Uh, I think science and the law, and this is, this is really why, I'm, why I am in the field that I'm in, this sort of mystical world where law and medicine uh, come together. I think science and the law are always in a dynamic tension that seems usually uh, to allow science to move forward uh, in an ethical way, uh, and 
uh, really the, the, the catch line of this is uh, you can argue about sanctity of uh, human life all you want, uh, but the change in Michigan law did not stop a single embryo from being destroyed once it was no longer felt to be necessary uh, for reproductive purposes. So that should give you sort of an overview of the uh, ethical and some of the legal issues. Uh, Professor Schneider will give you uh, more details about uh, the regulation of research in a second. Thanks for your time.